All right, let's go. So, welcome. Uh, thank you for getting up at horrible, horrible o'clock in the morning to, uh, to attend this one. Uh, so this talk is on uh, your domain model is too big for RAM and other such fallacies. So I'm going to be declaring war on disk. Uh, we don't like hitting disk, we don't like database servers, and I'm here to tell you why. So I guess the, the first consideration, the, the first thing I want you to keep in mind through, throughout this talk is we're not talking about grandma's knitting supply shop. If I do that, I'm going to be in people's right here. We're not talking about little applications that we can run on a single web server and a single database server for their entire lifetime. Right? We don't care about that. That's fine. Go and run Entity Framework. Go and run an IIS. By all means, do your thing. It's perfectly OK. You'll never hit your performance ceiling. Right? What we're talking about here is applications that need to go really, really fast or need to scale really, really big. Right. So to the code, because I know that everybody came here to see the code. Um, I guess that the first thing I wanted to, to address is um, where do all our CPU cycles actually go? Like, I mean, this... NSA. Say again? The NSA. The NSA, yes. <laughs> That's a good point. Or SETI. You know, you're running, who, who's, someone, I, I know someone got busted again recently for mining bitcoins on somebody's production web farm. <laughs> well done. Um, all right, so, but if you think about it, right, so this MacBook here, um, it's a, you know, i7 quad core, it's got eight gigabytes, sorry, eight megabytes of L3 cache, uh, it's solid state, it's all it can do literally billions and billions of things per second. So why are we worried, and yeah, that's consumer grade hardware, why are we worried about handling a few hundred requests per second in a production environment when we've got all of this sort of raw power available to us? So where does it actually go? Like, it just seems ridiculous that we're wasting it and we don't even know where we're wasting it. So to start with, let's just have a look at where some of this stuff does go. So a really, really simple demo. And all I'm going to do is increment an integer. <coughs> well, I talk about high performance software and Visual Studio takes forever to load. <laughs> All right, so all we're going to do is we're, on a, we're basically running up a really simple unit test harness. Um, there's not much in it at all. Um, let's just open this class file and have a really quick look. Click, click, come on. All right, make big. All right, so all we're going to do here, so we're saying increment, incrementing a 64 int when constrained by time should actually be quite fast. Um, and all we're going to do is we're going to say here is our very own int. Uh, we're going to have a time constraint of one second that we're going to run this for. All we're going to do is we're going to increment our integer. Yeah? Like this is pretty simple. This is pretty much as simple as it can get. So let's run that. And then we're going to output how many iterations we actually managed to do. So let's run that test. Did it run that test? Well, I suppose it was quick. Ooh. Rumbled. New reshaper install, sorry. Okay, so when incrementing a 64 bit integer when constrained by time, we can do, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, 33 million odd operations per second. All right? Now, is, is that a surprise to anyone? Who would have guessed that we're somewhere within that order of magnitude? One person put their hand up, so I'm going to reward you just for putting your hand up. <laughs> You have your choice of oh, Weathers Original, Fantails, Minties, Exotic Minties, <laughs> and there's a, I'm sure these are going to go really fast, there's a Chris Bellow, which I've not yet quality controlled, so uh, it could be awful or it could be great. All right, so let's do this. What's the bet I hit the camera on the way through? <laughs> All right, so we can do about 33 million of these operations per second, and that's all pretty cool. Um, we can also do it, so when we're constrained by just a number of iterations, let's run that test, which is a similar test, except that, um, well, in that case, we're not actually doing a comparison between elapsed time and um, you know, allowed time. So basically, the other, um, the other test that we had, what we're doing, come on, 
Here we are. What we were doing is we were actually doing a comparison, basically saying, is my elapsed milliseconds less than one second in milliseconds every single time? We were actually spending more CPU cycles doing that calculation, that comparison, than we were doing the integer incrementation. So let's have a look then at the next bit, which is when we're constrained by iterations. Wow, that's chugging a bit. Here we go. Not the most, I guess, um, spectacular hardware performance that I was hoping for this morning. All right, but this time, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to start a stopwatch. We're going to do that for two to the power of 31 iterations, uh, and then we're going to stop the stopwatch. So here, we're not actually doing any integer comparisons here. We're just doing a straight increment until, oh, sorry, we're not doing any time comparisons. So we're doing a, effectively, it's a set, setting a value, so moving a value into a, um, uh, into a variable, we're doing a single comparison operator and then a jump if less than, which is pretty straightforward. And that one, which we ran, whoops, we're not constrained by time. And that one gives us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, about 2.4 billion operations per second. All right. Now, this CPU is running at about 2.4 gigahertz, plus or minus, you know, whatever it decides to spin up or spin down based on power and all that sort of stuff. So that's about what you'd expect out of this kind of hardware. All right. So where does it all go? Well, let's have a look at the third chunk of code, which is a really simple one. Um, and this guy, we're actually starting to do some logic here. So what I'm going to do, very, very quickly, I'll just give you a very quick walk through my domain. My domain, I have a concert, I have a customer, and I have a ticket sale. All right, this is a very, very simple domain. We'll get to a more complicated one in a minute. But to start with, very, very simple. Um, we're going to new up a customer, we're going to new up a concert, and then we're going to say, hey, this customer would like to buy a ticket to this concert, please. How many of those can we do per second? So if we look at what the code looks like here, make that big again. Yoink, yoink, yoink. Okay. Here we go. So we've got our stopwatch. We're doing this for five seconds. Uh, we new up a customer. We go concert.reserve ticket for customer, and we want to say we want to reserve one ticket. We keep account of our requests, and roughly every thousand requests, um, we spit out the number of requests per second that we're currently processing. Um, so the key thing here is that our um, our gig is actually keeping track of, sorry, our concert is keeping track of how many tickets it's got reserved and all those sorts of things. So if we run this test, this should run for five seconds or thereabouts. It should spam out a whole bunch of console.log, and you can see that we are doing around, what's our first one, 768,000 requests per second. Right. Let's put this in context. We've got Stadium Australia, and during the Olympics, or just before the Olympics when it was first built, that had 100,000 seats, 100,000 seat capacity. Um, and for a bunch of the Olympic events, I think the, uh, the record was that it sold out in like 90 seconds or something. But it's averaged about three and a half minutes for, like, I think the opening ceremony went in stupid time. But basically what we're looking for is, can we cope with that kind of load? That's the sort of contention we care about. Right? So if we assume that one of these operations is an actual ticket reservation, then we can do about 700, 800,000 of those per second right up until we actually start recording it into a SQL database. And then it all goes horribly wrong. So what we'll do, now here's my magic trick. My magic trick is, does this continue? Ah, oh, it does, winning. All right. So where does it all go wrong? So let's say that we actually want to scale up our application. So our pretty typical application design looks something like this. We've got a bunch of users over here. There has to be a cloud because there's a rule about being, you know, you can't have a diagram without a cloud. So there's an internet cloud. Here's our web server, and here's our database server. And that's all pretty crazy, right? No worries. And for grandma's knitting store, that's all you ever need. Don't bother with anything more than that. Run up in Hibernate, run up Entity Framework, we don't care, right? Um, Let's assume, though, that we get a little bit more popular. Let's assume that things are actually starting to get a little bit more stressed out. So what we do is we run up a load balancer, and that's pretty cool, because they're really clever, and that basically allows us to scale our web servers infinitely. Awesome. Don't turn on sticky load balancing, because that's really dumb. And hopefully you've not used session awareness in your application, because that's not the brightest thing to do either. Um, so now we're pretty cruisy, right? We've got a load balancer, and we've got a couple of web servers, and it's all good right up until those web servers start to struggle. So we add more web servers. And again, we're pretty cruisy. No worries, except that we've kind of got this one point of contention, and it's starting to struggle a little bit. So you know what we should do? Mongo. Mongo, web scale, bingo. 
you get a lolly for that. What would you like? <laughs> what sort of lolly would you like? A fantail. A fantail. Let the recording show the crinkling of the fantail packet incoming. All right, so what do we do? Let's introduce a service layer because that's going to solve everything. And for a while, it will. It will help us. It will offload some of the processing. We can probably cache a bunch of stuff. And, but when we get to this point, we are really not in a good state all right? because we can't scale anymore. All right? We have got the one database to rule them all and we are in a world of pain. All right. um, <coughs> excuse me. So what do we do? How do we solve this? Well, let's think about what databases are good at. So databases are great at storing data efficiently. And that's wonderful if you care about storing it in an nchar 12 versus an nchar or in varchar max or whatever, okay? But the reality is disk space is really kind of cheap. Kind of don't care about storing data efficiently. If you're talking petabytes of data, then we start to care, all right? But when I can go and buy terabytes for 60 bucks at Officeworks, we don't care about storing data efficiently anymore. Just don't, right? We do like structuring data logically. However, we need to think about the use cases for those structured pieces of data. And the way that we tend to structure database or databases is we like them nicely denormalized. So you know, two fellows named Boyce and Cod, they have their favorite normal form, and then we have fourth and fifth and all the rest of it. But basically what it ends up is we explode out all of these relationships to make sure that we don't duplicate any data, which means we don't have any kind of inconsistency. We don't have a record over here that disagrees with a record over there, and that's really nice. Except that when we actually wanna ask it questions or manipulate it, that's not so nice anymore. So the database is kind of useful as a snapshot or as a point in time representation of a state of the universe, but it's really not all that great at manipulating the state of the universe. Um, it does also provide a job security for a DBA. Who's a DBA? Who's a DBA and brave enough to put their hand up? You get a lolly. This means I have to peg a lolly at you. <laughs> what kind of lolly would you like? Fantail. Fantail, all right. I'm not gonna peg a lolly because I know I'll brain someone, so. Whoops, well done, thank you. All right. So, now, a good DBA actually cares a lot about mechanical sympathy. They'll help you performance tune their database. They'll make sure that they're running all their profilers. They'll keep an eye on, hey, you guys, you should really have an index there. A bad DBA will just wander in and add triggers. <laughs> Don't be that guy or girl. All right. <laughs> and if a developer does that and they work for me, they don't work for me anymore. All right. Databases are not so great, though, at a whole bunch of stuff that we'd really like them to be great at for this kind of use scenario. So responding quickly, quickly when they're under load, right? So this is the first thing that tends to go horribly wrong, right? Databases are kind of okay at lots of updates or lots of reads, but as soon as you ask them to do both of those things at once, really not so great. Um, large aggregate queries. Uh, so basically as soon as we do a select count of something or a select um, sum of something, we're talking at absolute best a clustered index scan. Um, more likely we're talking a full table scan if we haven't pre-optimized a database for this kind of stuff. Databases are bad at reporting. Right? They are easy to report against for the uninitiated. Unfortunately, that means they're just misused a lot more. Right? Databases are really, really bad at answering aggregate queries. Is that what SharePoint's for? It must be what SharePoint's for. It's got to be for something, right? There has to be a reason for SharePoint. All right. Um, the last thing that, objects, sorry, that um, databases are really quite bad at, though, is representing our in-memory objects our domain objects, our domain model, as we would actually like to interact with them. So what's the solution there? ORM. ORM, who said, you said that. What would you like? A fantail for you. Nobody wants my exotic minties. <laughs> what are they? They're like, is it chocolate and smooth mint? Chocolate and vanilla smooth mint, anyway. Okay, so we use an ORM, and now we have an N plus one of problems. Uh, <laughs> so, <coughs> Excuse me. So let's think about what's actually going on here. Let's think about what happens with a traditional web plus application plus data or just web plus data tier about what's going on in our applications. The first thing that happens is the HTTP request arrives and it's processed by the web server. Hip hip hooray. Um, we don't care about that for now. Um, you're not going to see a web app today, by the way. You can bolt, it, bolt this stuff onto a web app later if you want, but I'm using console apps and for the most part unit test harnesses. Um, the next bit is we figure out what to do and then our ORM maps our data to a SQL query. So say for instance we want to say, well, how many tickets are there available in this 
gig in this concert. Okay, cool. So um, a really naive approach, but still one that's likely to, to happen a lot, is we do a select count of star from ticket sales, where concert ID equals whatever the concert ID we care about, or we do a select sum if we've got a, um, a ticket sale that can have more than one record at, at a time. Um, and so we hit the database, and well, so firstly our ORM maps what we want, maps our link expression or our you know, expression tree or whatever it is, into a SQL statement. The database server then goes, well, I haven't answered that question before in exactly this way, so I'll figure out how I'll do that. So it'll do its like query execution plan figuring out. Then it will run it, uh, then it will send it back, right? And at this point, our ORM then goes and dynamically creates a whole bunch of in-memory objects. And it does this for every request, right? Every single request, okay, I want to get some responses back from my database. We're going to have to new up all these objects and mess with them. Okay, fair enough. Um, the next thing, so this is where we're actually doing useful stuff. Our domain logic executes and changes state somehow. So we add a ticket sale record to our um, concert or to our gig entity. So basically we say, okay, so our gig has now had another ticket or set of tickets sold for it. We then say, right, we're done. So we go back to our ORM and call save changes or session.commit or flush or whatever the end hibernate thing is that I can't remember. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And our ORM goes, well, I should probably generate some queries again. So it's going to generate an insert into ticket sales where, so, you know, with this value and that value and all the rest of it. And we're going to sit there and wait for the database server to then go and flush that and then update a whole bunch of indexes and all that sort of thing. And then it comes back and says, I've committed it. And that's all very nice. And then finally, we render our output. Hooray. Now, the thing with high performance code is it's not that you go really, really fast. It's not that you do dumb things really, really, really fast. It's that you just don't do the dumb things. So let's not do those. Right? Let's just not do those things. Right? If we didn't have to hit the database server twice, ideally we wouldn't hit it at all, but if we didn't have to hit it for a read, um, that'd be a heap quicker. Um, all we really want to do, to be honest, is have a request arrive at our server, do whatever the request asked us to do, publish what happened, write down what we did, and then the web server renders the output. Now this is actually not complicated, it's basically just leaving out a bunch of code. This is really laggy. Now, sorry, I'm using a wireless presenter and I have a sneaky feeling that something's interfering with it. All right, so um, let's talk about consistency then. So if we're actually gonna go and write down what we did, one of the things we care about is, well, who needs to know that and by when? So we've got two real kind of consistent, um, quick show of hands, who's heard of CAP Theorem? Okay, you don't all get minties just for that. But if you haven't heard of CAP Theorem, um, go and read up on CAP Theorem. It's uh, pretty simple to get your head around. It's insanely complicated to actually prove uh, what it proves for you. But basically, from consistency, availability, and petition tolerance, kind of pick two. You don't always get two, but you can only ever have two. Um, unless you're cleverer than like everyone. Uh, so when we care about high performance or high throughput systems, we tend to either sacrifice consistency or really care about consistency. I'm not gonna worry about the other two for now. So in this case, our social networking, right? Does it really matter if when I click like on a cat picture, everyone else sees that instantly? Yes. All right. <laughs> of course it does. All right, and you get a lolly just for heckling. What do you choose? What do you feel like? Have, have the exotic then, please. Tell me if they're any good. If I can open the thing. There we go. All right. So, what we care about... Whoops, heads. Sorry, John. Whoa! <laughs> he saves the minty but drops his laptop. <laughs> priorities, sir. Priorities. <laughs> All right. So, the thing is, we, we kind of don't care about consistency here. We care that at some point soon-ish, Everyone has the same view of the world, but we don't care immediately. And it's okay if I click like on a cat picture and one, per, one friend's news, pip, you know, sorry, news feed says that I click like on a cat picture and another one doesn't yet. That's all right. right. We can afford to have eventual consistency in a lot of cases. And when we can do that, scaling is really, 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 really cheap. Right? You shard your data, you chuck it out there, you, you know, synchronize it all. It's not trivial, but it's cheap. Right? You can throw hardware at that problem quite simply. That's not what we're looking at. This one though, let's say that we sell 100,000 concert, concert tickets. We've got 100,000 to sell. Off by one, 
eventual consistency in this case kind of really isn't an option. Now you can do things like having reserves and you know, you know, only allow, you know, allocating certain blocks to certain servers, or but it's really, really complicated. And for something where it's general admission and we just want to smash through it really, really fast, right, but we have to main cons maintain consistency, we could be in a little bit of trouble here. We sell 100,000 tickets when there are 100,000 for sale. Awesome. Everyone's happy, right? even the scalpers. We sell 100,001 ticket, right, and we're in a little bit of strife. Worse, we stuff up a little bit more than that and we sell a few hundred thousand tickets because we've got a synchronization issue with a couple of our nodes and all of a sudden we have a class action lawsuit on our hands and we'd really rather not have that. Right? So in this case, we care about consistency. We want consistency. Now consistency is actually pretty easy to achieve at this kind of throughput. So let's do some math first. I know, because we all suck at math, right? Um, you're in computer science field and we have no math. Um, it's going to be completely shameful if my numbers are wrong, by the way, but yeah, that's all good. Um, but I did triple check them so you can laugh at me even more. So let's have a think about it. How much does a customer record occupy in terms of space? Let's assume that they're going to have like a GUID for their ID because, you know, GUIDs are cheap and free and ints need to be sequential and GUIDs don't. So let's assume that we're wasteful and we use 32-ish bytes for a GUID. Let's assume that they've got a name that's on average about let's say another 50 characters if you have a longish name. Um, let's say that they'll probably have an address and they'll probably have a phone number and an email address and a bunch of other stuff. But we're going to fit pretty much all of that into like under 500 characters. All right. Um, UTF-16, two bytes per character. Okay, fine. We're going to fit a custom record in under, under a kilobyte. Yeah? So I've got 100,000 customers. Well, yeah. How, how's your you know, whiz-bang fancy system going to cope with my 100,000 customers? That's a lot of people. Well, do the math. Right? It's 100 meg. It's 100 meg of customer records. Oh, okay. Well, I've got a million customers. I have. I've, I'm a big company. I've got a million customers. You go, okay, that's a gig. I checked some pricing at a local reseller who I'm probably not supposed to name in this form, so I shan't. I can buy an 8 gig DDR3 stick of RAM, which is what's in this thing. Um, for 84 bucks which means I can store your million customers in 10 bucks 50 worth of memory. Why are we hitting disk? Right. Now we need to write it down somewhere, but why are we hitting disk to ask the same questions over and over and over? Okay. Repository.getById, some gig. Well, guess what? If Stadium Australia is on sale for the Olympic opening ceremony, that's the only gig people care about right now. Right, so we're going to be doing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of select star from gig where ID equals the same. And our SQL Server will cache it to an extent, but why would we do that? Why would we even incur the expense of that when we just don't need to? So let's not do that. So how do we store stuff then? And this is where we get into CQRS and event sourcing. And we're not going to cover event sourcing in detail, firstly because that's a really complicated topic, secondly because I don't have three weeks. Um, but we're going to do some fairly simple stuff here. So, <coughs> um, how are we for time? Do we want to, okay, so you have a choice now. Uh, we can play a game or, and you can run the risk of not seeing a disruptor implementation or we can skip the game and see disruptor code, which may or may not be exciting depending on what you care about. Disruptor code? Okay, we'll come back and play the Wall Street game later then, if we get a chance. All right. um, so let's write down what happened. And we're done. If all I do is write down, I sold Fred a ticket to the Olympic opening ceremony. One ticket. I write that down. Barney's a little bit smarter than Fred. Barney buys two tickets, which means Barney's not living in the doghouse for the next six years. But I write down, I sold Barney two tickets to the Olympic opening ceremony. Right. Now, when someone says to me, how many tickets have you sold? I can go and count them up. I can say three. Okay, cool. Uh, when somebody says to me, how many tickets does Fred have? I can go through and figure it out, and I can say one. Um, I can go and figure out how many tickets I've sold. I can go and find out all of my customers. I can find out pretty much everything I need to know ever about the state of the universe just by writing down what's changed about it. In a nutshell, that's all event sourcing is. Right? Rather than recording the state of the universe, you write down what you did to change it. You start from a known state, 
which is probably not the big bang, but it's no customers and no gigs and no ticket sales and nothing. Um, and then you just write down every single thing that you do to mutate the state of that universe in any way whatsoever. Sounds really like simple, right? So how does it get complicated? Well, when we spin up our application, let's say we've uh, been running for three or four days and we've been smashing through 100,000 transactions per second. If we want to spin up our application again, then we're going to have to go and redo that, which may well take, won't take three days because we don't have to reapply the same logic, but we do have to go and fish all of those facts out and reapply them, which might take two days, it might take one day. That's a long time for a server restart. Right? Yeah, sorry, um, like Ticket Tech or Ticketmaster or you know, Oztix, they're offline for a couple of days. Nobody really minds, right? So what we can do is we can take a snapshot, which is not the same as a relational snapshot. Basically, what we can do if we really want to is we can just dump memory, just do a binary format and go, here's my state of the universe. And when my app starts, I can just rehydrate, and then I just keep on replaying my events and my facts from where I left off. Now again, this is event sourcing 101. Right? There are so many better and more elegant ways to do this, but I really want you to just grasp the basic principles here. That's all I'm after. Okay. All right. So. How do I query stuff? Well, firstly, let's assume that I've got everything in RAM. When we measure disk latency times, what do we measure them in? What units? Millisecond. Who said milliseconds? One, brave per one, one person is the only person brave enough to put out their hand with the right answer. What lolly would you like, sir? Um, just a plain minty. Just a plain minty. <laughs> Old school. All right, incoming. All right, so. Right. So, we measure disk latency in milliseconds. Right? There's no lolly for this unless nobody gets it at all. What do we measure memory access times in? Nanoseconds. Nanoseconds. Who said that first? Up there. What, what would you like? A special minty. A special minty. <laughs> yes, were they any good? They were quite good. They were quite good. <laughs> oh, sorry. Bad throw. <laughs> sorry, guys. Okay. So, um, we're measuring memory access in nanoseconds. Right, so it's difference between 1 by 10 to the negative 6 versus 1 by 10 to the negative 9. That's three orders of magnitude. It's a thousand times faster to not hit disk. Can you see that I don't like disk at the moment? Right. There's really nice solid state in here. I don't care. I don't want to hit it. Right. But still, our naive approach is we can spin through every single thing that we've got in memory. So let's say we've got all our ticket sales recorded in RAM. Okay, cool. So we've sold 100,000 tickets. At worst, we're going to have another 100,000 ticket sale records. And they will be a GUID, a GUID, and a number. So a GUID, GUID, int. Right, so that's way tinier than our gigabytes worth of customers. Um, and we can spin through that really quite fast. Yeah, not so bad. We can sum that. We can do just like a link expression. OK, fair enough. Um, but we're still doing work there. So our next optimization is we should use something called a read model. Now, what a read model allows us to do is subscribe to a, screen, a stream of facts or events that are whizzing by. Right? So when we say, well, I sold Fred a ticket and I sold Barney a ticket, right? our domain model itself is going to record some sort of object that has a Fred and a Barney and a ticket sale and an event and all the rest of it. Um, our read model can just watch, whiz event, watch events whiz by and go, well, I'm just going to record how many tickets have been sold. That's all I care. I'm just going to keep a running count. I should probably also subscribe to an event that says, well, when the gig's capacity changes, I'd like to know that too. So if we get a bigger venue, then I can sell more tickets. Or if we get kicked out of a big venue and QUT says you all have to sort off into the itty bitty little room next door, then we can stop selling tickets. But our read model can subscribe to a capacity change event, and it can subscribe to a ticket sold event, and probably a ticket refunded or cancelled or whatever event, and it can update its running total. So now, think about this. We have gone from writing down the state of the universe and then asking the database for the state of the universe by doing a select sum of star from thing, right? all the way through to, if we've got a nice read model, reading four bytes of RAM. When someone asks how many tickets are there available to this gig, we either do a select sum of thing or we just say, here's an answer I prepared earlier. There you go. Now, how many times per second do you reckon you can read the same four bytes of RAM? Three. Three? You don't get a minty for that. Right. <laughs> so, so what we've just introduced kind of subversively here is a little co topic called CQRS, which is Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Basically, we do commands using one model, which has our nice domain model, it's nice and OO and pretty and all the rest of it, but we do our reads, sometimes from our domain model, but by and large, we do our reads from a read model. 
or a set of read models. We pre-prepare answers to a whole bunch of questions that we're likely to ask. Um, if we want ad hoc stuff or we're not quite sure what shape of things that, you know, shape of questions we need to answer, then yeah, by all means, hydrate your entire domain. Um, it gets a little bit tricky when you've got some bits of your domain persisted to disk and some all in RAM, but for the most part, pretty much every app that anybody in here writes is going to be able to store the vast bulk of its data in memory all the time without any trouble whatsoever. Now, one additional benefit that you get out of um, writing down what you've done rather than writing down the state of the universe is spinning rust. Who still likes spinning rust hard drives? The ones that like, have like, iron oxide on them and like platters and heads and stuff. Right. Who prefers solid state? Right. Most people prefer solid state. And in the vast majority of cases, so would I. However, the overall transfer rates from a bunch of mechanical drives is actually pretty staggering. Where they're awful is random access, random seek. Right. Now, if we're spinning up an application, then we don't have to do random seek. We can just say, you stream me from the beginning to the end, and the heads, rather than thrashing all over the place, just go tick, 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 tick. Right. And they can pump data out like a fire hose. Likewise, when all we are doing is writing to these disks, we're not reading, we're not doing random seeks anymore, and we're not doing random writes, we're just saying, write this down, write this down, write this down. Right? They can do that really fast. Throughput with mechanical drives is actually pretty good. It's the random access times that we care about. So let's have a look at a ticket seller app. Actually, close. And this guy. <coughs> I will let myself run about five minutes over rather than the 10 or 15 that we started late, so I'll still compress a little bit of this, um, a little bit of these topics, but I'll do what I can to cover most of it. All right, so we have a ticket seller application. We've got a set of ticket seller unit tests. All we really care about here is um, throughput. Here we go, make big. And in this case, what we're going to do, wow, that's chugging. I hope this runs OK. All right, so I'm going to set up a, uh, basically an in-memory database or an in-memory domain model. Uh, I'm going to create a uh, unit of work. I'm going to new up a customer repository uh, and a customer. I'm going to shove the gig and the customer into their respective repositories. And basically, that's my code setup. So that's setting up the state of the universe where I've got an empty, an empty gig and I've got one customer and I don't actually have any, uh, any tickets sold or anything like that. So basically what I want to do then is I want to be able to just smash in a bunch of requests. So every single unit of work, because I'm mirroring what we would do in an actual unit of work here, every single unit of work, who, who knows what a unit of work is? Everyone? Anyone not quite sure? Right. If you're not quite sure, think about it pretty much as a transaction. It's not quite, but it's, it's close enough. So, what we're going to do is every single unit of work, every single transaction, we are going to new up a customer repository, we're going to new up a gig repository, we're going to new up a ticket reservation service. This is emulating an, what an IOC container is going to do for us. We're going to call our ticket reservation service and we're going to say, try to reserve some tickets for me, for my customer ID and my gig ID. There we go. Uh, we're going to complete our unit of work and then we're going to call interlocked.increment uh, and pass a reference to our total requests. The reason I'm kind of calling interlocks.increment rather than just total request plus plus is because we are smashing a bunch of these requests in uh, basically based on the number of CPU cores we have in this machine, which according to this will be eight. So let's do that. And let's see. Let's just run that test and see what we get. So when concurrently reserving many individual tickets, we should process more than 50,000 requests per second. Now, this code is nice DDD code. We're not talking scary out parameters here and ref parameters there and all the rest of it. <coughs> We're not talking, you know, messing with other people's internals or whatever. We're still raising nice domain events. Um, if we actually go and look at what our code's doing, you can see we're doing a series of um, double dispatch calls. So we, we would actually do this quite nicely. So, whoops, let's do, like, him big. Wow, we're doing 50,000 requests per second on a machine that behaves like this in Visual Studio. All right, so gig.create, do that. That's kind of boring. All right, there we go. Smash requests in. So you can see we're doing dot as parallel and we're just constraining it to number of processes. Right. Um, 
So what we're doing is we're calling our ticket reservation service. And he has a method called try reserve tickets. I'm always scared that I'll hit my power button when I'm doing demos, because F12, which is go to definition, is like the next button over from switch the laptop off in the middle of everything. So if I do that, I'll do like a little dance or a juggle or something until it all comes back. So my ticket reservation service has some constructed dependencies on a customer repository and a gig repository, and it goes and fetches a customer from its repository, and it fetches a gig from the gig repository, and then it calls customer.tryreserve tickets, because the customer may want to have a bit of an opinion about whether or not it can actually do this. Right? So from a DDD perspective, our customer is the actor that's doing the thing. Right? So a customer is going to say, try to reserve a ticket. That's what they will do. We should probably have a method on our customer class that says, try to reserve a ticket. Right? Um, the next thing, the customer doesn't get to decide whether they get that ticket reservation though. So we're calling customer.tryreserve tickets. The customer decides whether or not they are in a valid state to do that. And the next thing they do is they do double dispatch pattern. They will dispatch that request to the gig to say, hi, could I have a ticket please? And then the gig gets to decide, well, do I have enough tickets free? Or, you know, so the customer can decide, well, am I good for it? Do I have the cash? Do I really want to go? What does my calendar look like? The gig decides, What's my capacity? We can say tickets remaining. So if tickets remaining is less than the number of tickets that you want, then sorry, you fail. All right. Otherwise, I'll write down that I reserved a ticket for this customer ID, this number of tickets. I will write that down, and then I'll return my reservation object out of this method. Right. So we are doing nice DDD design patterns here. We've got nice code. This is readable, it's testable, it's very pleasant to work with, and you can do 52,000 transactions per second in it. Right. Now I'm writing this into a memory buffer at the moment, um, but I'm, I am actually going to go and switch that over. This will make my test fail. Uh, I'm going to switch that over, and we're going to use a disk fact store rather than a memory fact store. Everything else should be identical. Right. And let's see now this is just writing flat files using an XML serializer to disk of those fact objects. I will publish this code, so I'm not going to show you the plumbing of how it's actually going. Um, but basically what we're doing is every single fact we do, every single fact that we generate, every single event that happens in the system, um, I use the term fact because we do a lot of event work about domains that involve actual events. So if we have an event that people go to and then an event that happens in the system, it's all very confusing. So I'm using the term fact to basically say, this is a fact, this is a thing that happened. So we're writing this stuff down. And at this point, our performance has plummeted from 52,000 requests per second to 1,100. But we're doing pretty all right. We can sell 1,100 tickets per second. So you know, that's gonna take us, what, slightly under 100 seconds to sell 100,000 tickets. Now this actually works. Right? This is code that we could actually use to sell those tickets now. It's, per it's persisting, it's writing down absolutely everything that we need to do to have this work for realsies in a real production environment. Right? And we can do 1,100 requests per second. Okay, that's, that's nice enough. Who wants to see what SQL can do? <laughs> All right, so let's close that. Uh, where are we? Oops, not you. Wow, that's gone. Not well. Okay, so ticket seller. So basically what I've done here is I've lifted the domain model code from the previous solution. I have plonked it down using EF6 code first. Uh, I've got the latest NuGets, or 6.0.1, the latest NuGets of everything. This is basically as fast as it's ever going to get uh, on, on this hardware. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so let's have a look. So I'm going to run pretty much the same test, it's structured the same, you'll just have to take it on faith that it is, but I will publish the code at some point afterwards. And I've even left the assertion there, which is that we should publish, sorry, we should process 50,000 requests per second. Um, and let's see how we go. Mm. Juggle, 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 juggle. We are actually running, right? Yeah, there we go. Uh, 203. Oh. That's, that's not very good. Um, <laughs> it indexed. 
All right. So let's actually talk about an index. All right. So the the index that we would add would be a clustered index on uh, gig and ticket sale with the number of uh, tickets included in that custom, custom index. So basically, I should be able to say just to the index, okay, I want you to sum all of the ticket numbers sold for that particular gig. Right, that'd be my clustered index, or the, my field in my clustered index. Um, yeah, okay, fair enough. What happens to write load? What happens to write performance in a database when you add an index? Plummets. All right. So is that going to improve our overall throughput, or possibly not? Yeah, possibly not. So what would we do? <laughs> so let's, yeah, we should use Lucene, because that won't. Uh, <laughs> here we go. So at this point, we can pretty much accept that a database just isn't going to fly for what we care about. It's just not going to work. We can shard stuff out. Okay, if you've designed your apps well, then you can shard your customers out and you can shard your gigs out and all the rest of it. But you can't shard a single gig all that well. Right? You can't shard an aggregation of a whole bunch of uh, ticket requests across a single gig all that well. You can do it. Right? You can do it. You can have a sharding key on ticket sales. Uh, you can run up you know, 10 Raven instances or whatever and you can do a select count of each of them. Or sorry, select sum of each of them from all 10. Uh, you can do the same thing with SQL Server. Right? But wow, that's a lot of effort. Okay, so all of a sudden, if I want to go and process 50,000 requests per second, well, on, on one SQL server that can do 200, okay, so that's five for 1,000, right, multiplied by 50, I need 250 database servers for something that my MacBook Pro can do. Now go and justify that to your CIO. So, we need some sort of con concurrency control about this. So let's assume that we're going to run all of this on a single core or you know, a single machine with a bunch of cores. Right. How do we deal with locking? Because um, locking is kind of important. Now in the previous example, what we were doing is we were having uh, multiple threads spinning up and smashing at a single gig. Um, now, that's actually a little bit dangerous. Um, it's catered for, but it's a little bit dangerous um, because we need to make sure that nobody's going to mess with that gig. So basically, between the time that I go, how many tickets have I got left, right, and then actually recording that I've sold another ticket, somebody else could have asked, how many tickets do I have left? I'll get the same number. So let's say we've got 99,999 tickets sold. We've got one ticket left. Right? And two threads come in, and one of them asks, how many tickets you got left? And I say one. And it goes, cool, I can sell a ticket. Then the other thread comes in, and it says, how many tickets do you have left? And we say one. And it goes, oh, cool, I can sell a ticket too. Then this guy falls through and actually does his ticket sale, and so does this guy. Whoops, we've just oversold. We promised that our system would have consistency and we just oversold our ticket allocation and we're in trouble. So we've got a couple of options on locking. Uh, and the way we decide how to lock is based on pretty much what's going to be under contention and why. Right? So we would lock a gig, for instance. We would lock at the gig level, we'd lock at the aggregate level when we had a, let's say we've got a thousand little gigs that we're running. And the likelihood that we're going to have people requesting a ticket for the same event, the same gig, at the same time is actually pretty slim. Okay? We're not likely to get a deadlock there. You can take a lock on this gig, I can take a lock on that gig, we're all good. Right? The scary thing is deadlock. Right? So I take a lock on this gig, somebody else takes a lock on that gig, then I take a lock on this customer and somebody else goes, oh, hang on, I can't do that. And then, so this, but meanwhile, this person's gone off and taken a lock on something else that I need, so all of a sudden I've got a whole bunch of threads that are deadlocking. Right now, it's easy enough to deadlock just with two threads, but you imagine that you're trying to process thousands or tens of thousands of requests per second. Think about how fast you're going to end up in deadlock hell. How do you spot deadlock without any special debugging tools? How would you spot it? Okay, that's part marks. And what does your CPU utilization look like? Zero. Zero. Good. You get marks for that. Okay, what would you like? Ollie, what would you, what would you like? Deadlocked? <laughs> <laughs> so what would you like? Ex exotic Minty. Okay. All right. So your application's performance goes effectively to zero. Oops, sorry. And your CPU utilization drops through the floor. So what happens is you log onto the server and you go, well, this must be getting absolutely smashed because no nobody's getting a response from it. And you look at it and go, oh, that's fine. It's sitting at 2% CPU. The problem's not here. Of course the problem is there. You just haven't realized it. Um, but that's an application design problem. It's not a hardware problem. Right. We've messed it up. 
Where we need good throughput, but we can afford to have deadlocks on occasion, sure, lock stuff. Go ahead, have multiple request handling threads. Do that, right? When we can't afford to do that is when we've got contention on a single resource that must remain consistent. Right? And that's where we either just lock the whole lot, basically we just have one global domain level lock that says I'm doing a, an operation on the domain, or we don't lock at all. We really should just prevent people from messing with the domain. And the easy way to do that is we, um, we only have one thread. You only ever manipulate your domain model with one thread. Now again, this is a very, very specialized use case. Right? By all means, in, in you know, grandma's knitting supply stores, manipulate your domain model with as many threads as you want. But if you want really, really, really high throughput, and you absolutely must have consistency, do all the work on a single thread. Which introduces the concept of a ring buffer. Because if I've got one thread that's sitting there, spinning very, 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 very fast, I need a way of telling that thread what to do. I need to be able to have that thread pull a request out of somewhere, do whatever it is that it's going to do, and then chuck a response back somewhere. Uh, now, we'll have a look at uh, some more, I guess, enterprising messaging patterns, shameless plug, in the talk that Damien and I are doing at 25 past 11 this morning. This is not that, right? This is a uh, producer and a consumer problem that we're solving on a single thread. Right? And so the way we do this is we have an input ring buffer, and ring buffer has got slots. Well, we don't have to have a ring buffer, but ring buffer is easy. Um, the ring buffer's got slots numbered in this case 0 through to 15. We've got 16 slots. Uh, there's an instruction in slot 0 that says reserve one ticket for Fred. Fred's going to be in the dog house. Then we've got us an instruction in uh, slot 1. Sorry, sorry, slot 0 reserve a ticket for Fred. Slot 1 reserve two tickets for Barney. Barney's going to be popular. Barney, you remember that he was supposed to take Betty to the event. All right, um, then the next one in the instruction list is we want to reserve 1,000 tickets for some scalper. So our request processing thread, our domain manipulation thread, just needs to pull these requests out of the buffer, do something, do something, thank you, and then reply. And it will reply using another ring buffer, easy enough. Great. The problem with ring buffers in general, so in this case we've got a response here now saying one ticket reserved for Fred, no worries, two tickets reserved for Barney, for Barney and bugger off scalper, we've got a maximum ticket sale cap of like 10 or something. All right, um, <coughs> excuse me. So the problem that we end up with, uh, with ring buffers is that they've got start and end pointers, and they're a little bit difficult to maintain, but more than that, what happens when we want to have multiple readers? So let's think about this from an actual event source and CQRS, CQRS perspective. What if I want to have multiple entities respond to things that happen here? All of a sudden, I can't just go and blow away stuff out of my ring buffer. I actually have to know, know about who is consuming the stuff out of my ring buffer. I don't actually know where my end pointer is anymore because I don't have one. If I've got five consumers, then I've got five end pointers. Does that make sense? Right? I need to know where all of my consumers are up to so that I can publish all of this stuff to all of them so they can do that. Right? So in one case, I'll probably have one consumer that's just spitting the responses out over, over the wire using like protobuf or something, so I don't actually have to hit disk on my processing machine. I can just spam out the responses, which means we can shard those disk writes or whatever to, to somewhere safe and fast, um, which means we can actually get this kind of crazy throughput. Um, I'll probably also have somebody else updating my read model to say how many tickets are left. Right, so remember our read model from earlier where we said, okay, I'm just going to watch those events as they happen, and I'm going to write down how many tickets were sold, and I'm going to keep a running total. Right, so I'm probably going to have some other listener who wants to do something like that. I'll probably have a bunch more that do a whole bunch of other pieces of work. Um, and I want them all to be able to subscribe to this, which means I can't have those little red end arrows. Tick, 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 tick. Which brings us to our disruptor pattern. Now, um, there's a um, really, really good implementation of a um, disruptor in .NET uh, written by... Oh, what was that? <laughs> Time to juggle. That's not good. <laughs> what is going on there? So laptop black screen with no good explanation. Here we go. Here we are. Hooray. Okay. So let's continue with that. Whoa. Minor heart in mouth moment. All right, so in this case, what I've got in my disruptor 
It's a ring buffer by any other name, but it's ring buffer with a little bit of a difference. It's only got a, a next slot free. Who is messing with the Wi Fi's? This is trouble. All right. It's only got a next slot free pointer. It doesn't actually know where all of the readers are. Okay. And in this case, what happens is the consumers, the actual consumers of, of the, um, the ring buffer itself, will keep track of where they're up to via a sequence number. Okay. Which is great, because then when we introduce multiples of them, we can say, well, I'm up to four, and I'm up to slot five, and my next free slot is six. So my ring buffer writer knows that he can spin all the way around, up to th and including three, and overwrite them, but can't touch four until that consumer is done reading it. Does that make sense? So now what we have is we have a really, really, really fast request processing thread, and all it does is pull in a request, do your thing, shove it out. Right? Then we have another thread, which is a producer thread, which is probably going to be pulling requests in off the wire, again, using something like protobuf or whatever, um, and it will just be inserting requests into my input queue, my input ring buffer, my input disruptor. And then my worker thread does its thing, and then it spits another response object into the output buffer, and then that goes and spits it off over the wire again, and we're fast. So let's go and have a look at that, which is this guy. And this is actually really simple. <coughs> um, I wrote this from, it's a trivial implementation, but I only, it took about half an hour to write from beginning to end. Um, so here we go. So basically what we've got is we've got one producer thread uh, and two consumer threads. And my test is asserting that when I bang in a gazillion, I think it's 100,000 messages or a million messages or something. When I bang in a bunch of messages, basically, um, I should, both of my consumers should see all of those messages, so they should see the same number of messages each. Um, and we do actually have, I'll make that big. Come on, here we go. So we've got our writer task, and its job is basically to spin through the number of messages to write, which in this case is 10 million. Right. We have a reader task one, which will just read a whole bunch of messages, and we have a reader task two, which I won't show you, but it's identical, it's just copied and pasted. Um, we've got some cute stuff in here, so we've got a barrier object, who knows what a barrier object is? One person, two people, maybe. Okay, so a barrier is a synchronization primitive. Basically, it's like a starting line, right? What we've done is we've said, this is a barrier and it needs three participants, right? What this is allowing me to do is spin up three threads and make sure that they are all ready to go before we kick off and to make sure that they are running concurrently. So we knew up a barrier here, we say, wait for three people, right? And then this guy says, okay, I'm gonna signal and wait. I'm gonna signal and wait. And the third guy down here calls signal and wait. When the barrier spots three, it releases them and they all go. Okay, so we're running these concurrently. The uh, thread.begin affinity basically says to the .NET CLR, I actually care that you should tie this CLR thread to a native operating system thread. In other words, don't go with shifting my thread around, like virtualizing the whole thing halfway through my gazillion request per second. I actually want this on a physical core locked to that core. All this guy is doing is writing a bunch of messages. All this guy is doing is reading a bunch of messages. Um, Ironically, the slowest two things in here are actually the console.write line and the assertions, which is why they're disabled. Um, I can turn them on again in a minute if we care. Um, Shouldly is actually insanely slow. It's an awesome assertion library. If you want to do a million messages per second, don't use Shouldly. Right. Um, so then at the end of this, we're saying wait for all of our tasks to complete for up to 10 seconds, uh, and then assert that the disruptor one reader read the same number of messages as we wrote, same as disruptor number two. And then at the end of it, we say how many messages per second we managed to pump through. So let's assume that we've got a worker thread that's doing some stuff. <coughs> so we've got a publisher thread, we've got our consumer thread. Let's assume that our consumer threads, the ones that are actually doing work. Let's actually see how long it takes and what sort of throughput we get. Oops, run that again. And what do we get? One, two, three digits, four, five, six digits, seven. That's 2.7 million messages per second that we're marshalling across threads. 2.7 million. Now, the thing is, this is not spectacular. It's just not spectacular. There is just a whole bunch of stuff that we've decided doesn't make sense to do. I have a confession to make. I've been lying to you this entire talk about hardware, because this is pretty cool. 
This is a 16 gig of RAM MacBook Pro. It has the fastest Core i7 processor that I could possibly buy. And that's not what I've been doing this demo on. Surface. That's what this has been running on the entire time. That's the kind of performance throughput you can get on consumer grade hardware. With that, thank you. We have time for questions until he throws us out. <laughs> Question, go ahead. In America recently, they had a bit of fun with a uh, system related to the Obama Health. You might have heard about that. What they might have done there. Do you have any insight on that? 50 different uh, contractors all working on fixed price contracts. All, uh, have you heard of Conway's Law? No, there is a law for that, but I can't remember the name. No, Conway's law basically says that uh, whatever shape your organization is, that's the shape that the software will create, will take. So if you have uh, 50 different agencies all building 50 different bits of the software, each with their own internal departments, that's never going to end well. Um, Obamacare was actually a really good example, or healthcare.gov was actually a really good example of something that could have used eventual consistency. It doesn't matter whether I buy a policy and then somebody else buys a policy and everybody sees and observes that in the same order, they could have just scaled that out really, really simply. Um, they just messed up. There's, there's, no, there, there's no magic observation to make there other than that was just a really badly run project. Just, just, yeah. Can I just follow up with uh, just a tail part of it? Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any prospect that in that organisation that produced that solution, their design of some fantastic project management methodology got the way of actually designing the solution? So, um, so well, that they were supposed to produce results today <laughs> Well, your project management's methodology should actually facilitate that design. Um, so if your design comes out badly, then that's your project management's fault for not making sure that that design hit prime time early and got found out to be bad. Likewise, if your design is just really, really bad, no amount of good project management's going to save you. You have to do both hand in hand. And it has to be an iterative process where you actually get that kind of feedback and you test it with for realsies data and for realsies load ideally before your you know, <laughs> leader of the free world announces that it's all good to go. <laughs> so, question up here. Um, you used uh, like your SQL demo. Isn't that a little bit unfair, like, given the overhead that it's giving? Well, it's a pretty fair challenge, I think, in terms of what we're actually comparing the two. Um, I mean, I could have used something like uh, you know, an event store or Greg Young's Get Event Store. But, I mean, I guess yeah. compared to your SQL. Um, well, even then, that means I have to actually go and generate my own SQL. Um, and I'd actually, as, as much as I dislike Entity Framework as an ORM, um, I think that their people are probably better at generating SQL than I am at doing it in line. Yeah. Um, I could probably optimize it by using like stored products and stuff, but then we are so far out of the land of nice domain driven code and testability and all that sort of stuff. Totally it's agree. just horrible. And, and developers cost more than hardware. <coughs> yeah. We're just yeah. comparing performance, so it's kind of maybe a little. Well, I guess the, the thing is, these are the tools of choice. These, these would be my tools of choice for each of these particular scenarios. So if I wanted a SQL database with a nice you know, OO you know, uh, abstraction over the top of it, EF is what I would use. Um, whereas if I wanted a really, really high throughput you know, solution, then this is probably something along the lines of, of what I'd use. So I actually went to my go-to solution for, um, for any framework. I haven't introduced, there's IOC in there, but we're not actually using IOC in the um, in the test harnesses, we haven't introduced latency from a container or anything like that. So I kind of gave Entity Framework as, as fair a shot at it as I could. Um, and the, the reality is that that's the kind of performance difference you're going to get out of, out of something like an ORM. Um, in Hibernate, maybe a little bit faster in some cases, maybe a bit slower in others. But if you're handwriting SQL, you're stealing from your client. Um, like seriously, you're handwriting SQL, that means you're doing absolute grunt work and you're introducing security flaws by like, you know, SQL injection attacks that your ORMs will pretty much take care of for you. Um, and really for itty bitty benefit, if you really care about performance, just don't use those tools. That is worth a lolly. What would you like? Special minty. You get one too. So the reason I was waiting for somebody to ask that, and there is a really good answer. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the L3 cache size on this MacBook, which I was actually lying about to you because it was a pathetic little Core i5 in a surface. 
Right? We're doing millions of requests per second on that, don't forget. Right? Um, <clears throat> A ring buffer has the uh, advantage over um, just a, a massive queue in memory that uh, you can size your ring buffer to fit entirely within the L3 cache on your processor core. Um, you don't want an L1 or L2 um, because you want it to be shared across threads, but in that case, eight megabytes of level three cache, uh, which means I'm not hitting my main memory bus, I'm only ever hitting the CPU cache for my really high performance thread. So I can have someone writing to that buffer, fetching stuff from main memory, and I don't care if that thread gets blocked. But my really high throughput thread, I don't want people touching it. Does that make sense? Yes. Excellent. We have time for one more and then we're done. Do you have problems with ring buffer um, as a dependency on result of the consumer? Say, for example, the example you give, gave was um, I'm going to have a reader that updates the counts for um, Facebook Messenger and Twitter. Yep. Do you have any problems with that? Ah, I see. No, you take that and do that on, off on a worker thread. Um, if you really want to do computationally expensive stuff and it needs to be consistent, then that's not a ring buffer issue. That's just that's just an expense of doing your domain logic. Yeah. So if you absolutely, absolutely must get the right answer, then yes, you need to do it on that worker thread. So be it. That's just a cost of that computation. Um, but for anything else, yeah, you just chuck it onto another worker thread and, and have it stale. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.